Virginia. Their sheer brutality often makes up for being outnumbered. What uh, defines them is the, their propensity to do violence. They're a very violent group. They're a nomadic group. They are to themselves quite introverted as a gang. Uh, a lot of antisocial behavior. The pagans have been linked to assaults, theft, and extortion, as well as weapons and drug trafficking. From menial bull nothing to murder. Jimmy D is proud of his life as a one percenter. He joined in 1972, giving up a college football career to pursue an outlaw lifestyle. What happened was I was working in a gas station at night when I was going to college. At 3 a.m., there's only two people out, cops and robbers. So the Peggins would roll in after the bars closed on their motorcycles. I got to meet them, know them. One thing led to another. Jimmy D's life took a turn toward the dark side. That's when he developed what he calls his jacket. The violence in my jacket is part of being a pagan. Most of that was barroom brawls, interclub wars, bikers against bikers. All of that is part of being a pagan. That's everyday life. The bottom line is you don't take crap from anybody. Denny asked to have his identity concealed. He was taught to value brotherhood and violence above all else. Just all go down together. You, know, you go in together, you walk out together. Simple as that. Denny got to know the Pagans in New York. If you want to ride on Long Island, and wear a patch, you were pagan. That was it. There was no, no ifs, ands, or buts. It wasn't long before he felt like part of the crew. I got to shit here and there, and they always had my back. I'd have their back, whatever, so it worked out good. Then he joined in the early 90s. His sponsor made sure he knew who his enemies were from the day Denny swore his oath. I went to his house and said, listen, we all want you to prospect. We want you to be a pagan. We want you to make sure that you know we're at war with Hell's Angels. The Hell's Angels are the pagan's mortal enemy and the largest motorcycle gang in the world. Denny never forgot it becoming a loyal and effective soldier in the war between the two gangs. You ever smell old blood? Um, pulling teeth out of your knuckles, pulling teeth out of your axe handles, pieces of brain. Uh, I mean, I've, I've seen some up beatings, some nasty The battle between the Pagans and the Hells Angels has been raging for decades, often with deadly consequences. February 23rd, 2002, Plainview, New York. The Pagans gathered at a bar called Diamonds. Many had traveled from out of state, including the crew from Philly. Dave Hennenlauter, a Nassau County detective, was there that day. You had guys from, from all over the regions coming. Some of them didn't even know why they were coming up. They were told, hey, we're going on a run. You got to go to Long Island. A run is a trip the gang takes together. This run was a mandatory, meaning the gang didn't have a choice. Mandatory is a, someplace you're going, whether you want to or not, whether you, your wife's having a baby, whatever's going on, you're going. When the Pagans arrived, they were told to get ready to do battle with the Hells Angels. Their enemies were holding a tattoo and motorcycle convention called the Hellraiser's Ball at a nearby convention center. This was the first event that the Hells Angel had sponsored in Nassau County. The Pagans felt it was an insult for the Angels to be holding an event on Long Island, a Pagan stronghold. They wanted revenge and knew they'd have to pay a price to get it. Some of these guys wrote their wills. They wrote wills on napkins. 
one guy he he uh, left his his motorcycle to his daughter you know so they you know they, these guys prepared themselves because they didn't think they were coming back the Hellraiser's ball was open to the public meaning there were plenty of women and children mixed in with the gang members Hennen Lauder was doing surveillance at the event I was in there with a camera I was in there like a regular civilian taking photographs. This man, Detective Smith, asked to have his identity concealed. He was working undercover with the New York State Police at the event. There were more than 300 people in outside. There were several hundred or more. Everything was real calm. There was no problem until uh, Pegas showed up and uh, all hell broke loose. Hennenlauter was outside in the parking lot when the altercation started. When the Pagans came up, they parked their cars along here, and they got out and they walked up here. The Pagans knew it was on because they all came out with clubs. You see them walking in with uh, their axe handles. Detective Smith saw the first Pagan come through the door. I hear this roar. And then within a few seconds, this Hagen, well over six foot, well over 300 pounds, is yelling. He had in his hands a piece of lumber, not a finished axe handle or a two by four, just a big stick. The Pagans began pushing their way through the front door armed with everything from axe handles to Uzis to metal pipes and knives. Detective Smith noticed a Hell's Angel preparing to defend himself. He produces a small semi-automatic pistol. The scene erupted into a full-scale war. When the Pagans go to take care of business, they go to take care of business. Repercussions don't matter. Results don't matter. It's brotherhood. The Pagans pride themselves in being the most violent motorcycle gang in the U.S. These nomadic bikers spread their terror across the Northeast, intimidating anyone who stands in their way. In their culture, they feel whatever they do is correct because that's what's been instilled in them. If they kill someone, they're killing someone because they felt it was appropriate because that person had done something against the organization, something against the club. As far as citizens go, you're above them. You're as far as guys in other clubs go, you're above them. The Pagan secret code demands that members must be willing to die for each other. No questions asked. If you don't give a f then you're the right man for the job. This combination of brute force and brotherhood has defined the pagans from the gang's inception. The origins of the club are unclear to outsiders. Some say it started in 1959 in Maryland and claim it was geared to racing motorcycles. The focus didn't last. When we talk about outlaw motorcycle groups, we say gang. While they may have started in the, you know, the 50s and the 60s as uh, riding clubs, they did progress into traditional organized crime. For the Pagans, the change took place in the mid-1960s under the club's second president, Fred Dutch Burhans. Members credit him with making the Pagans what they are today. The president when I started was a guy named Dutch, Dutch Burroughs. His policy was kill them all. Dutch expanded the club, founding a half dozen chapters in Virginia and Maryland. The early members wore swastikas to scare people, but claim racism was never a part of the Pagan code. At one point, I wore a swastika. It's the power of fear. It's part of getting the public's attention. Don't get me wrong. There's racists in the Pagans. There's racists everywhere. During the early 1970s, Jimmy D and his brothers loved nothing more than riding, partying, 
and sleeping with as many women as possible. If there wasn't group sex, I never would have joined the Pagans. It was one big orgy. Everybody get naked and jump in a pile. The Pagans, led by Dutch, expanded north into Pennsylvania and forged an alliance with another outlaw biker gang known for violence, the Sons of Satan. The club's leader was John Vernon Marin, AKA Satan. Then, in 1975, Dutch was shot and killed in a domestic dispute in Virginia. Satan folded his gang into the Pagans, and Philadelphia became their headquarters as they slowly took over the city. There was a club called the Dragons. There was a club called the Warlocks, the Breed, the Wheels of Soul, the Thunder Guards. These were all clubs in Philadelphia. The Pagans shut them all down. The pagans' violent nature took root, and they became known for their quick tempers. You'd be in a bar, and one of your boys would get into some shit, and you don't know what it's about. You're there, and you take care of it. To finance their way of life, the gang got into the drug trade, focusing on methamphetamine. The pagans control the meth and Philly, always have, always will. Jimmy D knew meth was the key to the gang's continued growth, as evidenced by this surveillance photo, taken of him dealing just two weeks after his initiation. Meth is the key drug of most motorcycle gangs, most bikers. It keeps you up, makes your party longer, makes you ride longer. The gang revered those running the drug trade, but the true power lay with the man behind the scenes. The Pagans all worshipped them, looked up to them. What they said went. But the guy behind them was the cooker. The guy who made the meth called all the shots. The Pagans cooker was an outsider who they called a citizen. Before me, the club dealt with citizens, non-club members. So they were the ones making the meth, actually mob guys. I learned off of a guy named Rock and Roll. He was a meth cooker. He was hooked up with the mob. He was at the time the best. Jimmy D knew it was time to make his move. I saw where I wanted to go. I just started climbing. I went up to be from a nickel and dime dealer to an ounce dealer to a half a pound dealer to a pound dealer to a cooker. In 1979, Jimmy D became the Pagan's Philly cooker. We made Pagan purple. All the meth I cooked was purple. The purple is meth at its purest. To optimize profit, the Pagan's board of directors, known as the Mother Club, cut the drug before selling it on the streets. I cooked the meth, Mother Club got the pure meth. Then Mother Club would cut the drugs as they felt and distribute it through their presidents, which went through the rest of the chapters and on down the line. It went from purple to dark pink to light pink to pure white because cut is white. And every time you cut it, it got lighter and lighter and lighter. The Pagan's secretive ways meant that only Jimmy D, the cooker, knew just how pure the drug was and what it was cut with. Manitol, it's a baby laxative. And the best part is people used to do a line, snort, a line of meth and have to go to the bathroom. And when they went to the bathroom, they would come out and go, man, that's good stuff, I had to go to the bathroom. Little did they know it was because they were doing baby laxative. The Pagans cornered the meth trade in Philly. It fueled the gang's growth up and down the East Coast. Due to the gang's oath of secrecy, it's difficult to put exact numbers on the pagan size. At the height of their power, the pagans had 900 members and 44 chapters spread from Pennsylvania to South Carolina, making it the nation's fourth largest motorcycle club. 
With the size came inevitable conflict with other big outlaw clubs, especially their arch rival, the Hells Angels. The Hells Angels are, you know, the Mercedes of the outlaw biker world. The Hells Angels is probably the top outlaw motorcycle gang uh, in the United States. Uh, it's one of the largest, if not the largest, and the Pagans being one of the strongest. But in terms of structure and the criminality that they do, they're pretty much equal there. The Hells Angels were used to getting their way, but found the Pagans could care less. No matter how outnumbered the gang was, they would always throw down. If there's Hells Angels and Pagans, they're gonna fight. So if it's just Pagans and Pagans, sooner or later, one of these two guys is gonna end up getting into a fight with each other. So we just like to fight. The Pagans didn't stop at taking on other motorcycle gangs. In 1981, the biggest gang in America, the Italian Mafia, demanded a piece of the Pagans' drug trade. Nicky Scarfo was the boss of the Philadelphia mob. At some point, he decided that we were going to pay a street tax to the mob to be allowed to deal drugs in Philadelphia. He lost his mind when he thought that he could shake down the Pagan Motorcycle Club for street tax. The mob was tired of the Pagan's refusals and tried to pressure the gang by kidnapping a drug supplier. Jimmy D responded swiftly. I then got my crew together from my chapter, went down, and started kidnapping their people. On February 26th, 1981, Jimmy D kidnapped two made men. In a show of power, he forced them to drive through downtown Philly. We get to Broad and Walnut, the driver, I got a 45 to the back of his head, looks across the street, and there's four or five cops having coffee he says to me, if you're going to shoot me, you're going to shoot me now. He pulls up, up on the sidewalk with the cops, thinking they were going to protect them. Got out of the car and start running. Jimmy D was not impressed and showed no mercy. I got out of the car and shot him in front of the cops. The mobster lived to tell the tale, and Jimmy D was arrested. But his stint in jail would be short-lived. Philadelphia was very corrupt. We had a lot of people on the payroll. I wind up getting out of jail on $750 bail for a shooting in Center City downtown. His payoffs of the Philly PD meant it would be a year and a half before the case ever went to trial. The club's war with the mob would continue. But according to Jimmy D, the Pagans never paid tax while he ran the gang. We're the toughest giant in the valley, and you got to back that up. The Pagans Motorcycle Gang has built a criminal brotherhood based on violence and drug dealing. They've stayed secretive and exclusive, maintaining their hold over their territory with their own set of laws. Pagans live by Pagan rules. Don't want to be judged by law enforcement don't want to answer to society's laws. Pagans answer to their own code. This code is included in the Pagan Constitution, which governs membership requirements, the roles of women, and even the type of bike members can own. It's got to be a Harley Davidson, and it's got to be 900 cc's or more. That's in the rule book. That's what it's got to be. This is an outlaw motorcycle club with more rules than the Constitution. In order to wear the Pagan's name, members are expected to follow these rules. But Jimmy D says there's only one that really matters. The first rule is Mother Club is, is God. The Mother Club is what the gang calls its board of directors. The Mother Club sets national policy and club conduct. The chapters fall underneath its rule. The structure of the chapters is much like the military with a sergeant at arms, an enforcer and soldiers that come under the command of a chapter president, or what the pagans call a diamondback. These leaders wear a 1% diamond patch on the back of their jacket. Their word is law. If you got a 
listen to your diamond. You gotta do whatever your diamond tells you what to do. The Pagan's ultra-secret nature is forged by this unquestioning attitude. I could, at 2 o'clock in the morning, be in a bar and say to myself, let's go visit the guys in New York. Let's go visit the guys in Pittsburgh. The fact that we could float around and find a home within riding distance on a motorcycle was one of the best parts of being a Pagan. Though many want to become Pagans, the road to membership is not easy. Denny's journey started in an unlikely way. I met some at a party and wound up meeting a bunch of Hell's Angels, and I thought they were pretty cool cats. The Hell's Angels asked Denny to join. His membership in the gang didn't go as planned. I was at a party a couple of years later, and uh, this angel tried to f the chick I was with, and I wound up getting into a fight with him. I actually beat his ass, but then I got my ass beat by the rest of them. So I said, f the Hell's Angels, and uh, I started hanging out with the pagans. Denny liked the pagans' rebellious and extremely secretive ways. decided to become a prospect. It's a role that gave him many responsibilities with few rights. Any pagan can tell you what to do, but you got boundaries, it won't take the bike, it won't with your old lady, it won't with your house. Denny quickly moved from prospect to full member, eventually becoming a gang enforcer. Some guy messed with somebody's old lady or whatever, and they called me and said, listen, can you handle this for me? And I said, yeah, I got no problem with that. He often didn't know the details. All he needed was a name. I walked into this bar. I saw the guy, walked over and picked up a pool ball that bashed his skull in. And threw him out the back door, I got on my bike, and I left. When recruiting, the Pagans look hard for toughness, loyalty, and a do-or-die attitude that means everything to them. Back then, I could handle my look. I take care of business, I don't around, I won't take from anybody. I'm not an you know? The Pagans' code means they also prize men who can keep their mouths shut. The gang has developed its own language to help members avoid the law. Argo means Argo f yourself, and none you means none of your f business. What those words are used for is, for an example, we get grabbed by the cops. They bring us in. The cops start questioning guys. We just yell Argo none you to each other, which means we don't talk. The answer to every question is Argo none you. Argo f yourself, none of your f business. It's a code between each other. The Pagans react when a brother is facing the system, often using their numbers to protect their own. What you'll see inside the courtroom is 10 or 15 guys from the organization staring down the jury, staring down the witnesses, trying to intimidate the judge, trying to intimidate the prosecutor to make this case disappear. The Pagan way also extends to the women who hang out with the gang. They aren't allowed to be members and are considered property of their men. Women have a property patch, if they're lucky enough to have a property patch. The property patch says property of Jimmy Day. I mean, that's my property. It's like my motorcycle or my car. It's my property. I own that. I do with it what I want. You buy a car and want to paint it, you paint it. I got a property and I want to turn her out to the bros to the club or its members come first. Business usually comes uh, second. The bike usually comes third. The dog comes fourth. And the woman comes last. In spite of how they're treated, there is no shortage of women who are willing to be pagan property. They like that bad guy. They want to piss off their dad or something like that. You know, who knows what makes chicks do things, period. And makes them more Banging dirty biker is beyond me. It's unbelievable. It's like a magnet. The club, the lifestyle, the spotlight, the power tracks them like a magnet. There's more women dying to get, become a part of it than there are men. 
The women often become part of the pagans' drug trade. The gang will sometimes use them to carry drugs or weapons. Some clubs use women for surveillance. They'll use it for, uh, they use the women for intel. They'll use the women, uh, put them in specific places for jobs. The pagans take extreme pride in their club colors. That jacket means more to them than their family does. When you get on your bike and you got your colors on you with 30 or 40 guys, everybody's riding to a breast and cars are getting out of your way and there's nothing stopping you. It's like having an extension of your you know. <laughs> Their logo is on the center patch of their jackets. The Hell's Angels have that f***ing death's head that, that is a made-up character. The Outlaws have Charlie, who has crossed pistons and, and a skull. It's made-up cartoon f figures. The Warlocks have Harpy, who's got a and it's half a man, half a guy. They don't know what it is. The Pagan center patch is Zutar. It's a fire god sitting on the sun with flames around it. Sutar, he kicked the out of all the other gods. He runs hell. <laughs> He's a man, Sutar. He squatted down real low like that, to make all the other gods think he was a little guy. And he jumped up with that big fire stick, which is kind of like an axe handle, bashed all their brains in, and now he rules hell. The Norse myth of Sutar also inspired the gang's favorite weapon, the axe handle. Axe handle was uh, definitely the weapon of choice. Sledgehammer handle works good too. The only thing they don't do is shoot bullets. Pagans are willing to bash heads with no provocation. But the quickest way to earn a beating is by showing contempt for pagan colors. Your colors are the most important thing on the planet to you. No matter what, they have to be protected. In Philadelphia, the Pagans Motorcycle Club rules through a brotherhood of violence. Living Pagan and dying Pagan. The friend gave me the biggest in the world and started to fight over nothing. But it don't matter. You stick with your brothers no matter what. You know, that's how it is. The Pagans intentionally have stayed exclusive. They believe it gives them an advantage over larger clubs. When I was a Pagan, I knew every Pagan. So if you get a phone call that that Pagan has a problem a thousand miles away, it's easy to go to his aid. The Hells Angels get a phone call from a Hells Angel in California, and I'm from New York, and his name is Dog. I don't know him. I don't know if I'm so quick to go help him. This close-knit brotherhood isn't perfect, and blood isn't always thicker than cash. Jimmy D found that out the hard way. Baggins woke me up. Business is business. Money is money. Brotherhood is a hoax. In 1982, Jimmy was in prison after shooting a mobster in front of the cops. When he was told three pagans were conspiring with the mob to kill him and take over his drug business. For $10,000, those three guys sold me out and gave the mob the green light to kill me with no repercussions. I was a team member. I was the most pagan pagan in the world. It was all that mattered to me. To find out that my bros, my people, gave me the up to be killed by them suckers was more than I could deal with. Jimmy D made a decision. He turned on the men who had already turned on him, providing federal authorities with damaging details about the gang. I rolled over on every fucking pagan. If they didn't give me up, I'd still be a pagan today. I would have went to prison and kept my mouth shut and came back out in good standing. Them giving me up caused me to do what I did. 
The feds used Jimmy D's information to begin building powerful cases against the Pagans. The Pagans had two major RICO cases that devastated the leadership of the organization that specifically targeted the mother club members of the organization. By the 1990s, the gang was falling apart. In 1998, Denny became one of the casualties. All of a sudden, one day at 6 o'clock in the morning, you got about 100 feds and ATF guys banging on your door, with all putting uh, laser sights on your face. No one's, no one's going for the leg shot. Everyone wants that head shot. So it uh, kind of throws a turd in the punch bowl. Denny's pagan brothers had turned state's evidence. He was sentenced to more than 10 years in prison for conspiracy. You know, he's supposed to be all these big badass brothers and all this By the time we got to the courthouse, all your bros, they went for themselves, everyone saved themselves. While the pagans were crumbling, their biggest rival, the Hells Angels, were moving in on their turf. By 2000, the Angels had established footholds in New Jersey and New York. When they tried to move into Philly, the Pagans knew they had to make a stand. It laid the groundwork for one of the biggest gangland battles in history. In 2002, Philadelphia. The Angels began to recruit Pagans, attempting to get them to switch alliances. You do not trade in your colors with the Pagans to have colors with another organization, especially at the Hells Angels at that point. The first Pagan to become an Angel was Tom Thinker Woods, a former leader of the Pagans Mother Club. He contacted the Hells Angels and offered them the Philadelphia chapter. Said, OK, fellas, we want to come over. Give us callers, we'll become Hells Angels, and we'll deal with the Pagans here. We'll give you Philadelphia. And uh, that's, uh, I think, was widely viewed as a uh, mortal sin, so to speak, um, among bikers. The betrayal stoked fury throughout the Pagans' membership. In February 2002, the Hells Angels sponsored the Hellraisers Ball on Long Island. The Pagans believed that the traders from Philly would be there. The decision was made to teach them and the Angels a lesson. There's this call for Pagans from various places, including about three dozen from Philadelphia, to go up at that Hellraiser's Ball and basically take them on. The Pagans assembled, wrote their wills, then stormed the public event. You know, one or two guys, three guys got in, and the fight starts, and then more guys came in. It bottlenecked. They couldn't go anywhere because there's no way to get around. The revolving door at the entrance was the Pagans' downfall. Only a few members made it inside, and the Angels opened fire immediately. As much as they seemed like a uh, barbaric horde. They were effectively shut down right to the end. One pagan was shot dead on the spot. This undercover agent was standing right behind the Hells Angel shooter. Outnumbered, he had little choice about what to do. If I would have drawn down on this shooter, I'm sure that every weapon in that place would have been turned at me. Over 500 assorted weapons were found in the venue. They didn't care that civilians were around. The Pagans had come in with brute force and no escape plan. Most were caught by police in the parking lot. Some escaped, but were caught on nearby streets wearing their colors. In total, 73 Pagans were arrested. Two Hells Angels, including the shooter, Raymond Dwyer, were also taken into custody. Dwyer was charged with second-degree murder, a charge that was dropped in a plea deal. He ended up serving a year in jail on a related weapons possession charge. The Pagans still claimed victory. They showed up, went to Long Island, and thrilled them. Kicked the Hells Angels' ass in their own 
fucking territory. 73 pagans went to prison. No one talked. Everybody did their time. They went there for club business and they all came home. They made it crystal clear. They will go anywhere, anytime and take care of business. The war was far from over and the Hells Angels were hell bent on revenge. In March 2002, a pagan-owned tattoo parlor was firebombed in South Philly. Police suspected it was a retaliation attempt by the Angels. The Hells Angels continue to make their presence known in Philly. There were a lot of rumors that they were opening the clubhouse and then bam, it was there. They had a few parties and things like that. The Pagans took it as the ultimate disrespect. Well, the Pagans did exactly what the Pagans were supposed to do. Start shooting them, killing them. Philadelphia. The city had been the domain of the Pagans for decades. But the Hells Angels were moving in on their turf, and the war between the gangs intensified. In 2005, the Pagans took the battle to the extreme and murdered the Hells Angels Philly chapter president, Tom Thinker Woods. He was one of the original Pagans who had left the gang for the Angels. The Pagans followed him and murdered him on the Schuylkill Expressway. Killed him right there. That's when it came crystal clear. The Pegans run Philadelphia. The Hells Angels came to town. He was the president. He was the man. The Pegans killed him dead. No one has ever been arrested for the crime. The brazen murder was enough to cause the Hells Angels to concede Philly to the Pegans. The word in the intelligence community was that guys were getting concerned about the level of violence, the amount of heat and trouble that came with it, wasn't worth it. I have never seen the Hells Angels uh, run out of town uh, or any major city like that, like the way it, it occurred here. They just folded up shop and went away. <laughs>